Yes, I do love the Concordant version. Very accurate. Uh, no, actually, there is a version that I think may be more accurate. It's not as readable, but it's yeah, it's what's well, a cross between the Concordant Greek text, which is literal, literal. It's a sublinear, and the Concordant version. It's kind of yeah, kind of a in between. I've talked about this before. It's called the Debar translation. I'm showing it now on the uh, studio cam. The Debar translation. It was put together by a German guy, of course. What would you expect? F.H. Bader. The reason I mention this guy is because I also have a book called Chronology in the Scripture by this same man. And he sets forth a year for the inauguration of the kingdom. And the whole book is based on the six-day principle, a day as a thousand years, and we have the six days of humanity. And I think that this is legit. Now, I'm not even going to talk about this, except I'm doing it now. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it in detail until I master the topic and, uh, and I read the entire book. But what I've seen, without going into a thorough analysis of it, I'm impressed by the system used here, uh, which is the kingdom is a thousand years and God stops on the seventh day. And that means there would be 6,000 years before that. So if we can take 6,000 years from Adam and if we can know when that was, uh, then and then the eighth that then we can know the inauguration of the kingdom then the eighth day is a new beginning also the number eight eight people on the ark jesus was dedicated on the eighth day the eighth day means a new beginning in scripture and so that was, the new heavens and the new earth is the eighth beginning of the eighth time period so this is very interesting to me this all relates back to what i was telling you monday that i believe this stuff can be known and that people in the know will know when it's going to happen and they will be ready they will be astute they will be noticing signs they will be noticing years maybe god is going to use this book by fh bader to uh, tell people what year the kingdom's coming the year not the date the year i'm not a date setter but maybe i'm a year setter just maybe i am a year setter and, you know, and maybe God's going to use this to enlighten people about it. And this is all very exciting to me. And it just confirms for me that God is not doing this thing in secret. He's not doing it in a closet. He's not uh, laying down breadcrumbs. We're supposed to figure out where he's going. <laughs> he's not tricking us. He is unveiling himself to us. Of course, it's difficult language. Well, that's why we have to know the laws of language. So, on this, in this series, sometime in this series, I am going to unveil for you when I confirm these things and look at these things in more depth, the year of the inauguration of the kingdom. And you're going to be excited. That's all, I, that's all I can tell you right now. You're going to be excited. It's going to come as good news to you because it's closer than you think. It's not a hundred years off. It's not. Now, God is hard. You never notice that? Uh, it's tough love, right? Tough love. I always say, the scripture says, um, love your associate as yourself. And I always warn my associate about this. I said, associate, are you sure you want me to love you as I love myself? Because I'm tough on myself. I work out, I run, I lift weights. If you would look at my face in the gym during bench presses, it's like a woman in labor. So God disciplines us and he disciplines the world. And we see him on this throne in Revelation chapter 4 as one who is about to judge the earth. And again, at this time, I reiterate this from yesterday, he's not the father of everyone. He's our father now, but he's going to be the father of everyone. Father gives us a familial relationship. It is a warm, happy relationship, like John resting his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. This is not the image of God we see in Revelation. And I want you to know, well, I'm going to tell you this in a minute. Um, let's read again. John is awestruck when he's taken to heaven. He's awestruck. I came to be in spirit and lo, a throne. I'm in verse 2, the unveiling chapter 4. A throne located in heaven, and on the throne one sitting. And he who is sitting is to sight, to sight now, like a jasper stone and a carnelian, like a jasper stone and a carnelian. What's a jasper stone? It's a deep purple gem. Just like the lapis lazuli I talked about yesterday, the color is remarkable. And I think the 
common denominators of the stones that are used to describe God by these fortunate men who got to see visions of one like God, of a vision, okay, let's just leave it there. They come back with, and the only thing they have in their language, in their vocabulary, in their life's knowledge available to them to describe it is like fire or a gem, a jasper stone, like a carnelian, like lapis lazuli, like emerald. We're going to see that. John sees a rainbow soon. Going to talk about that tomorrow. So uh, while these things were not literally there, they're still significant. So we need to know what, why did it look like John, like jasper stone? It's, I think it's the color and the hardness, the color and the hardness. If you take the jasper stone, which is deep purple, and the carnelian, which is a really deep, rich red, like the ruby. You put purple and red together, and you have like a lured fire, like a, a giant flame. And God is described as a consuming fire. In Deuteronomy 4.24 and Hebrews 12.29, he's like a consuming fire. He's not literally fire. He's literally spirit, but he's like one. Now, to us, we don't have him in that capacity here in our lives. Uh, although he's still does hard things in our life, but he is the father figure to us now. But this is his role. And I got in trouble for this at a conference in New York because people said, Zender said that God is a liar. That's what they were saying about me after comments I made at a conference two years ago in Rochester, New York, somewhere near Rochester. I forget where it was. I said that God plays roles and he comes across it's, for instance, in the days of the law, he comes across as an angry deity throwing lightning bolts and thunders. And that he tells Israel to obey the Ten Commandments, but he knows that they're going to fail. And he knows that, as if you're reading my series on the book of Romans, uh, that the law came so that the offense would increase. So, God assumes different roles. Jesus Christ is called the emblem of his assumption. In Hebrews chapter 1, I think it's verse 3, the emblem of his assumption. At different times, God assumes different roles. But are the, you can make a huge mistake here if you're reading the unveiling of Jesus Christ and you think that this is a fixed likeness, that you see these hard stones, these brilliantly deep purples and reds and blues and dark colors, not light. You notice that John doesn't say the throne is made of um, a pillow and a marshmallow or, you know, chocolate pudding and uh, styrofoam. It's hard things. It's not a fairy tale little story god with birds flying around him. This is an austere image, and it's a harbinger of judgment. But this is not God's fixed assumption. That's what I want you to take away. Be just look at Jesus Christ. He's presented to us in this book as the lambkin. That's interesting, too, that where ordinarily Jesus Christ is the image of God. He always is. But in this rare vision of John's, we're seeing really God. And the lambkin is a little bit off to the side right now. It's a little bit off, just, just, just a little bit in the wings. And we see God as being hard like these stones yet precious and all but always with a purpose in mind judgment is coming but as i've said it's a uh, it's the necessary prerequisite for blessing upon blessing upon blessing and so at this conference they say well martin's saying that that god tricks people and for that matter, Jesus tricks people. Is he the Lion of Judah or is he the Lambkin? Is he a, a Lambkin? And that's the term. It's the diminutive form of the Greek word for lamb. It's a baby lamb. Not only is he a lamb, but he's a baby lamb. Is he that or is he the Lion of Judah? Which is he? He's both. But at different times, he shows different faces. The four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, show different faces of Christ. One is the man. One is the Son of God. One as the 
I can't think of it. A man, a servant. They're all different views. One is the servant, the one who helps everybody. One's more majestic, a higher vision of those. The Gospel of John is very spiritual. And one is of the lion of Judah, the bringer of the kingdom in Matthew. And one is portrays him as a man, like the rest of us. That, that would be Mark. All these different aspects of Christ in one person. Likewise with God. So you can't, it's like the poem about the men of Indostan who told about the elephant. One man puts his hand on the elephant's tail and says an elephant's like a rope. One man puts, a, these are the, the blind men from Indostan, the blind men. They're all groping at an elephant. Oh, one man puts his hand on the elephant's flank. An elephant's like a wall. No, no, says the other guy who's grabbing his tail. The elephant's like a rope. So it's one elephant, but there's different aspects and different elements. So don't think we're looking at a fixed likeness of God. That should come for you if you have not been comforted here to four. And I want you to be comforted in the midst of this judgment. All right, I remind you we're still in the throne section, and we're looking now at details of the throne, that it consists to John's view of jasper stone and carnelian, which are hard, unyielding stones. It's going to be God's way or the highway. In the unveiling of Jesus Christ, we're looking at hard, unyielding stones, and we're looking at deep colors, purple and red, which to me speaks of flame. God's a consuming fire, and he's certainly set up to consume in the book of the unveiling. But as I've always said, and I, as well, I insist, I will always insist on this through the book, that the judgments of God are temporary, they're remedial, they're brief, and they lead to the utmost blessing. 